Vicky and Co. Um, uh, speaking about agro ecology at um, another event and we were like we want to know more and um, often a lot in um, gardening and and horticulture and so terms are thrown around I mean what does biodiversity mean what does ecology mean what does agro ecology mean what does permaculture mean and so today we decided to focus on agro ecology and um, and um, also um, reading in some what does permaculture mean because we've um, Sometimes they can be quite similar, but there are also some differences. And it's just really good to get an understanding about um, what it means, um, what it looks like in practice in our local um, in our local um, growing and in our, our community. And also what challenges are coming up and how can we support um, and, and problem solve together and, and, and do action together. So. Um, I'm really excited to create um, people that I haven't met before, actually, except for Nicole, who I've met at um, a, another um, community garden based in Lewisham. Um, but yeah, I haven't met um, before. I've, I've heard Vicky speak before, and some of, um, some people attending today may have heard other people. Um, I, Rachel, I've, I've, um, I work for a community garden who orders plants, plug, plant plugs from Sutton Community Garden, and Rebecca Land Land Workers Alliance um, lo love on online and, and love lots of um, the campaigning work. So really excited to hear about that and um, um, the amazing work being done. So I'm not going to ramble on for too long. Um, the first um, person that we're introducing is Vicky Hurd and um, I'd let you do your own introduction, Vicky. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's um, it's very nice to talk to Incredible Edible and to Lambeth. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I, uh, I have got a slideshow um, and I was going to do it all full of bugs because I thought I was going to be talking about um, bugs because I've got a new book out called uh, Rebugging the Planet. There you go. Um, but actually, I think you wanted a bit more of a broader talk. So I, I will probably go a bit too fast. I apologise, but I have got bugs in there as well. Um, and I hope it works because sometimes it doesn't always work. Um, but uh, hopefully it will now. And oh, there we go. And so um, thank you very much again. I'm the head of farming at Sustain, um, which is an alliance of uh, about 100 um, um, more than 100 organisations, including uh, Land Workers Alliance, which B will be talking about um, after me. Um, I've also um, recently released a book called Rebugging the Planet, which I will, I will touch upon because I think bugs, a, a lot of interest in bugs at the moment. Um, people are, are more understanding now of the importance of bugs and why it's important that we um, save them <clears throat> and how they're under threat at the moment. Um, I think there's some really um, growing interest in that. And I tapped into that, did a book, and it's got lots of tips in it, lots of ideas about why we should. Um, but Sustain, just so you know, um, it's, as I said, it's an alliance. And I work on the farm policy. Um, we want to see a transition to agroecological farming for all farm use, for all farmers. And <clears throat> globally as well, we import 40% of our food into the UK. So that food should be produced in ways that support nature recovery, tackle climate change in ways of, and uh, traded in ways that are fair to the farmer, to the worker and high animal welfare. And that should be overseas as well as here if we're importing food. So we want to see a transition to agroecological um, farming and um, climate and nature action on land. Um, but one of the critical things that is often forgotten in that discussion People talk about what consumers can eat and what um, uh, government can do to support farmers, but they forget about the bit in the middle, the supply chains, the retailers buying the food, the people processing the food in the middle, the Nestle's, the Danons, the tiny restaurants, all the bit in the middle is often forgotten about. So we do a lot of work on that. Look at ways of finding innovative finance to invest in good farming practice. And then I mentioned my book already. So um, is the, um, do shout if the sharing isn't happening because I, I know it sometimes doesn't. Somebody shout out. So just to finish off about bugs, these are all pictures I've taken in my garden or in my community. And just to show the diversity and the glory <laughs> and the extraordinary diversity um, structures and designs. And I talk about the different, amazing different bugs in my book. 
Um, but I just wanted people to, to understand that they're just all around us. There's a lot of talk at the moment around rewilding the countryside, rewilding huge estates or farms um, and having fantastic results from that because nature learns to, you know, can recover itself and deliver lots of great outcomes. But we're all surrounded every day by wild things. They're just very small, so we don't always notice them. And we can all support them in our own community. So that's what the book is about. And, and this just illustrates a, a very tiny fraction of the diversity of bugs around you every day. Um, but there is a dark side to this. There's a really big problem with um, loss of insects. There's a lot of trends, scientific work, looking at trends um, in long-term trends of decline. In the UK alone, um, we've had a reduction in, um, in the uplands of wild pollinators and in crops. They're going up because crops attract the pollinators. But what you get is a, is a very large number of a very narrow set of um, insects. We've lost the diversity and we're losing wild bees. We're losing all sorts of wild um, insects and pollinators everywhere. Um, and they are so important for our food supply, absolutely critical, not just because of the pollination they do. They also um, uh, distribute seeds um, uh, and they provide an incredible soil um, nutrient service, particularly the worms, but there are many other bugs that do incredible things in our soils, breaking down plant matter to release the nutrients for the um, plants to grow or for the trees to grow to create our furniture or our houses or our tables and chairs. There's so many, everything we do and have, there is an insect or an invertebrate involved at somewhere along the line. So we can't do without them. They can do without us, but they can't, we can't do without them. Um, and also there's critical um, understanding of this now. And I was just very briefly talk about five key areas that we're working on. Um, so we're working on the legislation. Um, there's an agriculture act, which we did a lot of work with the Land Workers Alliance and many other organizations to make it a bit better than it would have been otherwise if we hadn't put a lot of lobbying pressure on MPs, on ministers and mobilized loads of the public to actually do something about um, putting agroecology at the heart of the act. We actually got it mentioned in the act um, it's not in the heart yet, but we did get a big um, win in a change of policy. We're going to be paying farmers in the future for the public goods, for the benefits that they can provide on their farm. And that's a really critical thing. If it works, and there's the big if, um, we need to make sure the Agriculture Act allows measures that really support farming in, in, in that transition to agroecology. And we need to have ha the supply chains to do the same thing. There's an awful lot of pressure for farmers to intensify, particularly now because of the Ukraine war, um, but to intensify to produce more and more food. But that more and more food doesn't give them better and better incomes. It just provides ever cheaper materials for a, a very intensely processed junk food food system that none of us actually benefit from and certainly pressure the environment and the animals too much. So what we think is agricultural, agroecology everywhere we, can, we know, because scientists have done the results, done this modelling, we can actually have all farmers producing ecologically, working with nature, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, having fewer but better livestock um, if they want to have livestock. But you also need to have demand side measures as well. That means we need to change what we eat. We need to reduce the waste. We need to not feed um, crops intensively to livestock or to cars or to power stations so we need we've got a lot of land-based solutions for the climate and nature crisis which need recognition and we're doing a lot of work on that as well with the climate cop you've probably heard about um in glasgow at the end of last year there's so much more that needs to be done so i've touched on agroecology briefly and the reason i'm not going to go into great detail because as you can see there i've i could have found many many um diagrams like this it's not simple it's a system and it, it's not a thing, it's a system. It's like soil, soil isn't a thing, it's a system that's constantly changing. But key things about it are that it should be fair, it should be um, supporting nature recovery and climate change, um, uh, reduction in climate change emissions and locking carbon into the system. And it should be about not wasting less, eating healthily, and about communities and farming communities in particular having a decent living. And that's so far away from where a lot of the food system is now. So it's a big transition from where we are now to all farms um, farming ag in agroecological ways. So they need to go in steps. There's gonna be a stepwise thing. That, so farmers will need to be able to be helped 
in that transition. But if you look up agroecology, you'll see lots of different examples and lots of different meanings. It's not a, a single thing like you'd say flame resistant sofa or something. It's a complex thing, recognizing the complexity of the system. But as I mentioned before, supply chains fail to value what matters. So it's very difficult for supply chains at the moment to actually value all those things that I just described, fairness, Newton, um, animal welfare, nature, etc. As you can see here, this is just one example of um, farmers' share of a slice of white loaf since 1988 has dropped dramatically. And I could have done that with any uh, so many products. And this is a, obviously an average. If you're in a, a really great veggie box system or something like that, um, we've got a great one in North London called um, uh, Growing Communities. And we know the farmers there get 20%, at least 20% of the value of the, the produce that we get but most of the farming um, system is getting less. And, and as you can see from this pie chart, they get on average 9%. And you can see that agriculture that at the top right of the pie chart, 9% of the total money we spend on food goes to farmers. And that's, that's, that figure has been getting lower and lower every decade. And you can see where elsewhere it goes. It goes to the food and drink sector, it goes to the retail sector, and it goes to shareholders, and it goes to profits and offshore tax havens, et cetera that the, the thing that really matters, the primary produce just doesn't get what it needs. It's not, we're not able to value it because we can't buy from people who are doing that trading in a fair way. So what we need is new schemes to support agroecology, permaculture, and for all farmers to do that transition. We, so public support for organic and agroecological is high. It should be supported through um, a public, publicly funded scheme to help farmers move to those kinds of systems. Um, but we also know that a lot of people can't afford, you know, veggie boxes or organic. So we need to make them accessible and affordable. We need to bridge that gap between um, the farmer and the um, consumer who wants to have that decent food produced decently with high welfare and, you know, ideally living wage um, for all the workers involved in the system. So we need those trading systems to be growing. So local food systems with traders who are, are fair and value the produce. Um, and we're doing a whole project around peri-urban food because we think there's a huge opportunity to grow more, peri more perishable, the fruit and veg, in the peri-urban areas, particularly around London. I know Lambeth has got some great schemes. We want a lot of peri-urban food, like the old market gardens of, of yesteryear. So have more market gardens based on soil, on agroecological system, not, not high-tech vertical food growing, which gets loads and loads of investment and is bound to fail. But so these are the kind of things that we want to see happen, um, schemes that support farmers in that and people able to support farmers in that as well through how they purchase. Um, so that was a very quick skim through. Actually, I might have done all right in terms of time, um, but uh, do buy my book or I've got a website as well, <clears throat> rebuggingtheplanet.org, which has a lot of tips in it as well if you can't um, buy the book. Um, but also have a look at the sustainweb.org website because we've got loads of different campaigns around food and farming. And um, it's really important to grow the, the movement as much as we can. Um, I'll stop sharing now. I hope that was useful. Um, sure. There you go. <laughs> How did I do? Was it too long? No, oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. We've got um, uh, just a, a bit of time for a few questions if anyone has them. Otherwise, we will move on to the next speaker. Ronan, did you have your hand up there or was that a... I, I was clapping, but I do actually have a question. I wouldn't yeah. mind. Asking. I, I'm particularly interested in you, what you said about the peri-urban growing. Mm -hmm. I'd uh, be curious, what do you think the future of that is? Do you think that's more community gardens or yeah. do you think it'll be more of a, a commercial? Um... I think, yeah, that's a really good question. I think we need both because I think community gardens, we have a whole um, campaign around community gardens. We just launched a big this year's community garden thing called Good to Grow um, and getting people involved and getting all the well-being as well as the fresh produce and the green spaces available for communities wherever they live. Not, not just in special places, you know, exclusive places. So community gardens have got a really important role, but we're, I'm actually running a project called Fringe Farming and Rebecca is involved in it as well. Um, and what we're doing is trying to create the policy environment, both the local authorities, but also national government um, so that we can actually grow peri-urban enterprises. Um, so they'll be actually providing jobs 
and skills training like Organic Lee, which is a great example up in North London. And there's many other examples. And we're working with five cities. So working in London, um, Cardiff, Glasgow, Bristol, and Sheffield um, at the moment. But the, the interest in it is growing. And what I'm doing at the moment is trying to do a bit of um, back of the envelope analysis, um, looking at what we did have in terms of market gardens um, sort of 50 years ago, 100 years ago, um, to see what the potential is. Um, but we're very clear it's about agroecological food and um, fresh produce grown in ways which also supports a, a green space in, a, in what can be very deprived urban areas, particularly peri-urban areas. The big barriers are land and money, finance, to get the good things going and training. Um, so we, we're working with Land Workers Alliance on, on trying to overcome a lot of those barriers and some of them are national. A lot of them are local, lo local authorities very reluctant to give up their land, but there's so many wins wins from peri urban and urban food growing. I mean, really it's, it's, it's a bit of a no brainer, I think, sustain things. I hope that answers your question, but we have got a fringe farming bit on our website and I can talk to you another time about it as well. It, yeah, um, it, it does. I was going to ask you about the barriers and I think you've answered that, so I'll let. Land is a big one. Um, we yeah. want new. We want it to be an opportunity for new entrants, and there is a new entrance scheme that Defra are launching. But we're a bit worried it's just going to be about enterprise and new entrepreneurship, and not really tackle the, those three big barriers. And land, as ever, as I'm sure Rebecca will touch on, is a is a big barrier. Access to land, but there is a lot of land out there, um, and a lot of it's owned by local authorities and institutions like universities or the church, and we could be opening that land up. Um, for enterprises which could provide jobs and skills and training and some green lungs around the city cities thank you okay thank you and um i think we've got time for this one um where does regenerative farming fit in with the concept oh. of agroecology from robert finley that's a good question as well. I, I maybe should have done a, a big de definition slide, but um, I'm a, I've actually written a blog about um, regenerative a few months ago and it caused quite a stir because I was being quite negative about the way in which regenerative um, farming, the idea of um, a, a system which regenerates itself isn't just static, but it can actually regenerate itself and therefore provide us with food forever without having to use loads of inputs, extensive inputs and harmful inputs like fertilizers and pesticides. Um, but it's been co-opted, I feel, somewhat by um, huge corporations. You will find all the big global food corporations are using the word regenerative to describe what they help their farmers to be. And I, a, I'm, I'm, I don't think they do help their farmers to be that a lot of the time. They might force their farmers to do things differently in order to be able to tick some boxes. But that, all putting all that aside, regenerative can be a really important part of the picture. Um, and, and as long as it's not co-opted or captured by those wanting to sort of, for instance, do carbon offsets, um, the aviation industry and other industries which are heavily carbon um, emitting are often using land, regenerative land things and plantations as a means to offset their carbon emissions. So regenerative is, is being a bit misused, but you know, we, I use it, I say agroecological, regenerative, organic, brilliant. I mean, the one thing about organic is it's brilliant because it's got a, a legally binding um, set of rules behind it and it's um, accredited. So if you're ever unsure, organic is a really great one. But uh, there's, you know, loads of farmers doing brilliant, brilliant regenerative and agroecological farming as well that aren't necessarily organic. Thank you. So it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> That's why we're yeah. here today. <laughs> yeah. And it's often soil based. It's very often regenerative is based on soil rather than the whole system. And I think, you know, we're in we're for the whole system and fairness. And that's why agroecology matters, because it's about the check supply chain as well. Brilliant. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. I've seen a, um, a hand raised from Dan, but Dan, we're just, um, I'm just conscious of time and I said a few questions. So I'm going to move on to the next speaker and then um, if you can hold your question till the end, that'd be brilliant. So I'm going to move on to Rebecca now from um, Landworkers Alliance and please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. It's really great to be here and um, really great that Vicky started off because um, there's so much overlap in what we do and Trying to speak about all of this in seven minutes is quite a challenge, but um, thanks to Vicky um, cultivating the soil, we've um, got off to a good start. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and 
Um, so, oh, hang on. Okay, hopefully. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. Right, yes. Thank so, um, I'm going to talk about Land Workers Alliance, um, who are a union um, of 2,088 workers. I got this hot off the press today. Um, and we, we very much complement um, Sustain. We're a member of Sustain, which is an alliance of organisations working for a more sustainable food and farming system. But we're very much a grassroots um, union of farmers, foresters, growers and land-based crafts workers. Um, and then we also have, oh, I don't know why that's just gone off there. Let me just, sorry about this. I'll just stop share a minute and get it onto, You're right there, Rebecca. Do you need any help? Um, can you see my screen? No. No. Okay. Um, Are you still able to share? Yes. Um, it, oh, no. it just went out of sharing and um, and then I got it into sharing, but it wasn't, I got it into the slide one, but it's, um, let me just try and share again. Yeah. Um, Yeah, that started to share. Okay. Sorry. Looks, yeah. Yes, you're in, you've done it. Right. Wonderful. Sorry. Well done. Okay, so um so it's been Land Workers Alliance has been going for um ten years and um was set up to be the UK branch of a global organization called La Via Campesina, which is a network of two hundred million peasant farmers across the world many of whom are in the global south. And La Via Campesina started in about 1990s in response to the very unfair trading system that was being propagated by World Trade Organization. And they came up with the term food sovereignty, which is in a nutshell, although it's much more complicated than this, it's about um, bringing control of the food system back to local people and to the people who eat the food, people who grow the food, um, and taking the control back from corporations which are running the food system mainly for profit. So we take part in a whole range of different activities, and I'm particularly going to talk to you tonight about our campaigning and advocacy activities, but we also do training, um, we do member support and solidarity both in the UK and globally. So you can see a bit of a spectrum of some of our activities here. Um, and um, I'll just say a quick word about the whole agroecology, organic, um, regenerative sort of definition. As some, um, as Vicky mentioned, um, there's a lot of overlap between these terms and Land Workers Alliance has particularly chosen to use the term agroecology because we see that as going a step beyond organics in terms of being very much in tune with food sovereignty and putting people very much within the food system and rather than seeing people as being outside of nature people are very much part of nature and are managing natural systems we're getting so many of the resources we need not just food but timber and fiber and so forth and the the supply chains that bring these um, products to us are as much part of the agroecological system as the actual production system on the ground. So organic farming is a really um, fantastic system because it has a legal definition. And one of the 
one of the risks that some people um, sort of are concerned about about the term agroecology ag agroecology is that it can be um, taken to mean a whole range of different things and it can be taken to mean um, farming with some use of chemicals as opposed to no use of chemicals which is the way we'd interpret it um, so many of our members are actually organically certified but we also have many members who are so small in terms of their production systems that it's quite challenging for them to be certified because it costs five or six hundred pounds a year to be organically certified so we're trying to be a much more inclusive movement um, but we also include members who are regenerative and who are working on a larger scale um, and also many members who are practicing permaculture but I won't go into that at the moment um, because that's a whole other big subject so um, just covering our campaigning work um, as Vicky mentioned we've done a lot of work over the last six years about getting the term agroecology into the Agriculture Bill and now the Agriculture Act as it, as it now is. Um, and these pictures feel to me really significant. The one at the top is of an early um, protest that we had outside the DEFRA offices, called awesome. Table, awesome. which was um, basically just after the Brexit vote, when they were starting to design the new um, agriculture bill. And at that stage, Land Workers Alliance was very much outside the system. And um, we organized a banquet outside DEFRA and invited um, DEFRA officials to come and eat lunch with us and read our proposal for the post-Brexit agroecology, the post-Brexit agricultural policy. Um, and although it was a bit of a frustrating day, Vicky actually spoke at this um, demo, it was a bit of a frustrating day because apparently a memo went out to all the DEFRA officials saying that they weren't allowed to come and eat with us. But it did actually mark a real um, watershed in, after that, we started being invited to meetings, to being on round tables. We've been, um, hope we've been able to host various um, study tours of DEFRA personnel. And the picture at the bottom is when we had a group of DEFRA people come and visit two um, small market gardens in Devon. We've also had DEFRA people coming to visit Perry Urban Market Gardens in London twice now. So um, that's been really significant. One of the really exciting things we've um, managed to achieve is to get an input into the environmental land management scheme, which is the new payment scheme that will be um, shifting the way payments to farmers are made from farmers being paid per hectare that they have entitlements to claim on to being paid for the public goods that they deliver. And we've been working really hard to make sure that um, horticulture, which is something that many of our members do, is included in that. Um, and also that agroecology and small farms are included in that because at the moment small farms, farms of five hectares and under, aren't able to claim any entitlements or any farm payments. So although we haven't 100% won that yet, it feels like it's getting closer and closer, which is really exciting. Um, we're also working on policy in Scotland and Wales, as well as England, because um, being devolved nations, they have slightly different ways for organising their agricultural payments. So we have um, policy workers in Scotland and Wales working on trying to make their farm payment systems much more um, environmentally sustainable and also accessible to people of all different scales. Another big area of our work has been looking at the food strategy white paper. So we were lobbying a lot on the national food strategy and um, we're really eagerly awaiting the new food strategy white paper and hoping that that has things in it that are going to be supportive of the kind of farming that we're, we're advocating for. And then finally, um, an area of our work is international solidarity because 
in the UK, as Vicky mentioned, we're very reliant on imports. And so our food footprint effectively um, impacts people in other countries, and not just our food footprint, but also um, the other things that we export. So for example, at the moment in Britain, we're manufacturing a pesticide called Paraquat that um, has been banned in Britain because it's just such a an awful pesticide. It's so damaging to ecology. And yet it's still being manufactured here and exported to other countries. So one of our campaigns at the moment um, is to, um, to lobby MPs to stop this. And also we've got an action on the 8th of May, I think this. there'll be a notice at the end. So um, moving on to what, oh, um, moving on to things that are particularly relevant to um, Incredible Edible Lambda. Um, yes, we're very much involved in the fringe farming project. And um, this picture at the top um, was taken during our peri-urban study tour to Dagenham Farm. And I just love the juxtaposition of the horticulture and the power blocks behind. And it just shows that you can have um, significant um, amounts of veg being produced both in and on the edge of cities. Um, the Growing Communities project um, that supplies veg to about 1,200 households in and around Hackney, they're actually um, sourcing their produce from a mixture of urban, peri-urban and then what they call rural hinterland farms. So they're blending it, so it's a pragmatic mix. And then what they can't get from those three sets of farms directly, they buy from wholesalers, which are sourcing it from nationally, from Europe and from worldwide. So it's trying to sort of, rather than being purist and saying that people need to eat kale and um, Swedes all the time, or seasonal food all the time, they're saying, well, we realize there's a transition in terms of um, customers' tastes to having a mixture of imported and UK produce, but gradually um, they're bringing more and more UK food and making sure it can be grown here. Another big area of um, food production is right, to, or our campaigning is the right to food. And um, we've actually got a um, food sovereignty um, event happening in September, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and the bottom, the bottom picture is a, a people's food policy, which was a sort of precursor to the national food strategy that we worked with a number of other NGOs to develop to try and get um, the kind of policies that would create a fairer, more sustainable food system in place. Um, so I'm realizing I've already gone quite a bit over time, so I'll just move on to the final slide, um, which is some things that you can join in with. Um, yes, the Paraquat campaign, please do um, look at our website. All of these things you can find links to on our website. Um, there's a letter that you can um, send to your MP, or if you really are keen to join in, we've got an action outside the Syngenta factory on 7th of May. Um, we've got a land skills fair, which um, we're selling tickets to on the 21st to 24th of July, which is a really lovely festival. Um, it's not just for people who are working on the land. Anyone can come to it. We've, it is a ticketed event, but um, there are all sorts of different land skills, campaign workshops, and it's just a really lovely chance to get together at some um, Abbey Home Farm in Gloucestershire. Then we've got a People's Food Summit, which is a bit more accessible. It's in London um, from the 16th to the 18th of September. And on the 15th of October, which is World Food Day, we're organising a Good Food March which I think is likely to be very focused on the food strategy white paper. Hopefully it will surprise us all and have lots of things that um, we're hoping for in it, but the chances are that it won't quite meet the mark and there'll be also things that we need to um, 
kick up a fuss about. So um, please put that in your diary if you can't get to any of the other things. And then finally, please do consider joining Landworkers Alliance, either as a supporter or if you are a land worker as a full member. So um, sorry, I've taken up 15 minutes, but I will um, stop sharing and hand back to you. Brilliant, thank you so much. And I just, I just, in my head, I just wrote, I just said, you know, you've been an activist in so many ways and it's brilliant to see all those different examples and hear about the, the hear about it all. Um, I think we've got time for one question, if that's okay. Um, Dan, would you like to go or? Uh, down in the room. Hi, yeah, so I was just, um, I've got kids and, uh, running around making noises. Um, no, it was just a quick question, really. One of the things, I was at um, a really interesting event and there was a big farmer there sort of saying, well, we definitely can't move away from kind of monoculture farming because we need wheat, for example, was his example about large scale farming of wheat and things. How... And part of that, I think, is about consumers and us expecting to have wheat based carbohydrates within our diet almost every meal. Um, but also, how do we how do we do that in a agroecological sort of sense in terms of small scale farming, mixed kind of farms? How do we meet this need for, say, processed wheat based products? Because, you know everyone likes a hovis loaf, for example? That's a really, really great question. And I would say it's, I mean, you've probably hit on one of the most challenging things because growing cereals is one of the more difficult things to do um, in a non-monocultural way. There are definitely ways to do it. And um, people like um, the late Martin Wolf, who um, set up the Wakelands Agroforestry Farm, he actually did a lot of his research on more diverse cereal crops, which actually are much more resilient to diseases because you've got genetic diversity. And if, for example, fungal spores are bouncing off one um, plant, then if they hit another that isn't so susceptible to it, then it stops the spores in their track. And um, there are much more radical um, ways of doing this where you've got whole um, different mixtures of grains being grown together in polycultures. But I would say that we are still in, um, we're still not where we need to be to really roll that out on a large scale. Um, I mean, there are also other issues within the supply chain, which Land Workers Alliance is trying to address through its resilient local food systems um, work. For example, um, milling and storage of grains, um, the whole rural infrastructure has been so decimated by industrial farming that we're kind of having to rebuild um, the food systems for doing the processing of things like grains and also meat because a lot of abattoirs have been lost over the last 20 years. Um, so I would say, it, we need to be thinking in terms of a transition and it's not going to be something whereby all farms become small overnight and I actually think we need to be helping larger farms to transition to being more sustainable rather than just saying it's all going to be small farmers who scale up and there'll be more and more and more of them. I think a lot of large farmers have really valuable skills that we need to be learning and we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater and I think it's really important that we're working in partnership with them. But then there are also, that also brings up challenges such as the use of agrochemicals, um, the reliance on um, fertilizers, which are getting more and more expensive. But I, in a strange sort of way, even though things feel like they're quite extreme at the moment with the whole food security issue coming as a result of the Ukraine, it does feel like that it could actually start tipping us into the place where the transition that needs to happen happens a lot faster. I choose to try and be optimistic. You could very easily be pessimistic, but I think we've got almost a duty to be optimistic and just keep pushing on that um, door of hope and thinking, well, 
this could be an opportunity rather than um, something terrible, but also putting pressure on government to keep making the right choices rather than making the wrong choices. I hope that's somewhat of a satisfying answer. I know it's not some um, black and white, but these things never are. Brilliant, thank you. I'm going to move on to Nicole now, who's um, um, studying Masters in Ecology. And so, yeah, thank you, Nicole. And thank you, Rebecca. Hi there. Um, yeah, my name is Nicole. Um, thank you, Obi, for inviting me to talk at the event. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about, I guess, um, yeah, what I... Um, what I've been focusing on in, in the big umbrella of what agroecology is. Um, yeah, like Obi said, I'm currently a master's student in environmental humanities um, and trying to focus more on small plot and urban land initiatives as um, and the ways in which they contribute to climate justice um, and resiliency um, against the climate crisis, which many of us know the most affected um, the most vulnerable to which are folks who are already um, face many injustices day to day, like working class people, rural peasant farmers, um, black and brown and indigenous people. And that's whether it's in the global south or in the north here in the UK and Europe and stuff. Um, and in terms of agroecology, what I think is really interesting is that um, it's all about relationships. Um, ecology is all about um, relation, the like, yeah, relationships um, and agroecology is um, this emerging knowledge system that I think recognizes not only that there needs to be a change in agricultural systems um, towards more sustainable methods, um, but also recognizes the need to address the socioeconomic political power relations that it exists within that holds it up that like they're kind of embedded within each other. Um, and these industrial systems, the ever expansion of monocrop plantations and livestock raising and the like um, is one of the leading ca causes of the climate crisis, probably preaching to the choir. Um, but yeah, that the um, and the food produced on the corporate scales is shown to be less nutritious um, and not reach and also just not reaching vulnerable communities, um, especially in urban areas and whether that's because of food deserts or just a simple lack of affordability for a nutritionally dense, fresh and diverse food stuff. Um, so I guess really deeping what that means is that these agro-industrial systems, I think carry their effects like right down to our most like intimate molecular levels, our neurobiology. Um, it affects our, the production of our neurotransmitters, which is affected by our diet and the toxins and pollutants that we're exposed to in our day-to-day -day environment. Um, meaning that we don't have the molecular building blocks that make life vibrant and worth living and worth, worth sustaining and doing something with. Um, and so then, and also I guess when you kind of under, start to understand the ways in which, especially for black and brown communities, mental health and criminality and policing are so enmeshed and so intertwined, um, we begin to have a picture of the ways in which agro, like industrial systems, um, diet, mass incarceration, policing, class, land rights, and all of these forms of violences are not only on a molecular level, but our socioeconomic realities of people of like, they create these realities um, and feed into each other, like in a loop in, um, in the relationship similar to that, what we saw in the presentation earlier. Um, and yeah, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic showed, I think how access to green spaces is a health issue. Um, and it's a large factor in resilience to inf inf of infections of the of COVID um, and also of mental and phys mental health and physical physical health um, and yeah due to a lack of access and heavy policing of inner city areas and communities it's a completely it's a very politically charged issue as well. Um, so yeah, I think understanding things more in relationships help us realize that nothing really exists in a vacuum. And I think one of the things that I've been finding really interesting and in focusing on is um, the historical, um, the, yeah, this is the, the historical place of the plantations, like where did they come from and the history, the like really violent history of colonialism and slavery that, that is invoked when we say 
plantation. Um, and yeah, and how plantations we have in, in that violent way become the building block for these food production systems, but also the economic and social and political systems that are still in play today. Um, but at the same time, this um, like subaltern history of small plot land tending, even on the plantation in these in the midst of all of this violence was was occurring, which is um, enslaved people were tending land um, for feeding each other and, and themselves. And they were sites of immense biodiversity um, where human, where people and land were in deep relationship with each other um, and was life sustaining for, for themselves and also on a multi-species expansive level um, and how these sites played a major role in freedom and, um, and yeah, helped many enslaved people escape and, and led to eventual freedom. Um, so yeah, I think it's really interesting how throughout history you have the development of these two parallel realities. And I think in terms of agroecology, um, it's also a large recognition of what's already known, like what indigenous people all over the world have already been saying that their worldviews, that their ancient knowledge, cultural life ways and, and traditional knowledge systems are valued and um, are, are of value and are, um, yeah, and, and even though they're different to like the dominant um, scientific logical science systems that are supposedly the be all end all of knowledge, like they're not, that these other like understandings and knowledge systems that people have ingrained and of people who tend to the land are valid in and of themselves and should be recognized um, and protected. And um, yeah, in terms of urban land initiatives, um, I think there's a real drive in people to reconnect with the land in urban areas um, and reestablish relation, a relationship with the land. Um, and yeah, I think it's really interesting the way that that can affect your feelings of wellness and community and care. Um, an example that I really like is that of soil and tending to a compost heap and how, um, how revolutionary that can be if that's not something that you've had the opportunity to experience um, in your in your life, you know, in your day to day, and how, for example, just the how revolutionary it can be, like seeing how we add food scraps, leaves, paper, whatever it is, into the heat, and what we get back is that rich, fertile soil um, to then grow more food, grow abundance, nourish ourselves, nourish our lives, um, and how that cycle. Um, that intimate cycle of life and death of giving and receiving is so revolutionary to witness when when you don't have that kind of experience before um so yeah i think it's really interesting all of the yeah the ways in which um, when people are giving the opportunity to reestablish this connection how it can affect our feelings of wellness um what i what community means and what care means and also affect our visions of like the vibrancy of the planet and that we are in nature, that we are all nature, everything is worth protecting and worth um, and worth caring about in a, on a deep way. Um, care and the surge of mutual aid in the pandemic being a really big significant example, I think. Um, because like a lateral is community centered and it's separate, uh, but parallel to the dominant oppressive systems um, and turning towards initiatives across London, for example, Coca Collective, which I um, go to sometimes, which is a um, black led growing initiative in South London, as well as others like Go Grows Love and um, work that Land in Our Names is doing with the Land Workers Alliance. Um, I what I think is that um, a central component is that they kind of recognize that there's um, no environmental sustainability. Um, you can't really fight the climate crisis without justice, um, um, but especially without land justice and without fostering um, a connection and that relationship of, with the world we live in, with everything around us, with our environment and our place. Um, because I think oppressive systems will have us feeling like we don't have a place, especially as diasporic people, we're always placeless and we're always other, um, but diasporic placemaking and ancestral knowledge keeping and land tending are ways in which we can subvert this and create new realities. And yeah, I think reality making as a concept is just really exciting because um, it's in the day to day, like 
mundanity of things. It's in everyday choices. It's in people having more opportunities to, to tend to compost, to learn tree names, to know what soil is on an intimate level and how, yeah, the real, it creates real change. Um, the act of putting kitchen scraps onto the soil, like that's where reality is made. And yeah, I think that's what agroecology means to me, <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, thank you. I know we're pushing time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to one question if that's okay, if someone wants to jump in. Otherwise I'll move on to Rachel. Any questions? No, I'm going to move on to Rachel because the um, reason why I paired um, Nicole and then Rachel next is because um, Sutton Community Farm is is a real life example uh, of um, agroecology and other principles and um, will relate to a lot of what um, has been spoken about and especially Nicole, what you're speaking about, has spoken about too. So yeah, um, Rachel. Cool, thanks Obi. And um, yeah, it was great to hear you um, all talk, Vicky and Becca and Nicole, um, and thanks for having me. Um, I'll try and be quite speedy because I haven't got much time left. Um, but yeah, so I am one of the head growers at Sutton Community Farm, um, and we're a seven acre farm um, and member of the Land Workers Alliance, actually, um, on, and we're on the south edge of London in Sutton. Um, we're just on the green belt on the Woodcote Estate, which has got a really long history of food production. Um, so, yeah, so we grow lots of vegetables on the farm. Um, we've just started growing fruit and we also um, have grown flowers for the last couple of years, although we're not doing that uh, this year. Um, we sell our veg through a veg box scheme and um, we buy in uh, kind of extra veg and fruit to supplement the veg from the farm from other organic farms. Um, we are a community farm so we're owned by um, about 400 members and we have about 50 people coming to volunteer every week um, on almost every day of the week. Uh, we run supported volunteering sessions, um, occasional school trips and also like really importantly, very focused on training new farmers. Um, so we run a paid traineeship, um, which we recruit for every year. Um, so yeah, I will, I'll just sort of skip on to um, sharing with you some of the ways that we practice agroecology on the farm. Um, and yeah, I think it's important to say that like agroecological and permaculture practices are like really not new. They've like, in originate in kind of indigenous farming methods and the ways that indigenous people have been farming forever um, as part of nature. Um, so yeah, we definitely kind of identify as an agroecological farm, although we are becoming organically certified, um, but we sort of, yeah, identify with agroecology because of the sort of community and like people element of what we do and our focus on like people within our farm and farming community. Um, and like, as Rebecca said, like people are not outside of nature, we're very much a part of it. Um, so yeah, so as an agroecological farm, we see our farm as an ecosystem. So like a community of lots of different organisms that are all interacting together um, in like a living system. Uh, we see ourselves and our crops as a part of that and our role to kind of responsibly steward the land and care for the ecosystem whilst producing food for our community. Um, so we mimic uh, nature in our farming practices and kind of uh, look to natural systems to guide how we manage the land. Um, so it maybe goes without saying, but we don't use any um, artificial pesticides or herbicides or fertilizers on the farm. Um, but yeah, so we, so yeah, in nature, um, a balanced and diverse ecosystem is a healthy one. So that's what we're trying to achieve uh, on the farm by sort of taking care of and creating more habitat um, around the farm to increase the diversity of different species that are living within the farm. Um, so yeah, if you just go to the next slide. Um, so we planted like hundreds of meters of hedgerow. Um, and in the next slide, we've created two large ponds. Um, we've sown lots of areas of wildflowers. Um, 
and we also manage the kind of wild margins of the farm on a rotation so we kind of there's lots of brambly areas that we cut rotationally uh, so that there's always that really good kind of wild overwintering habitat for lots of different like insect species and then that kind of brings the bird species and just yeah that kind of diversity of lots of different um uh, organisms being supported um, by our like farm, um, the habitats in our farm. Uh, so yeah, we also make sure to manage our crops for the benefit of other other organisms that we share the farm with. So yeah, that slide before was the right one. Um, and especially those organisms that will help us with pest management. So this picture here is some um, purple sprouting broccoli that we've left to flower. And so once we've finished cropping from um, the broccoli in this case, but um, and the other brassicas as well, uh, when we can, we would always leave it to flower so that we um, are providing that like source of pollen for pollinating insects. Um, and yeah, and then of course the foundation of a healthy ecosystem is the soil. So we have a really big focus on soil health and mimicking how soils in a wild habitat like a woodland would function. Uh, so the ways in which we do that and which like everybody can do on like any growing space that they're on. Um, so we add lots of organic matter to the soil. So um, in the form of compost, um, in the form of kind of the residues from the crops that we're harvesting, um, that we just kind of like leave on the bed. So at the moment we're harvesting our crop of leeks um, and we kind of trim our leeks um, right onto the bed um, that they've come out of. So rather than leaving the soil bare where we've harvested the leeks from, we leave the residues of the crop and cover those over um, to aid kind of the breaking down and they're just like all of those residues of the leeks are um, feeding all of the organisms in the soil. Um, so that's just one, one example. Um, yeah, and we use green manures. So one of these pictures here, um, that beautiful phacelia and you can see some clover in there as well. So green manures are like a really um, brilliant way of um, like providing habitat on your farm for lots of different insects and then food for, um, for other organisms um, and also um, of adding organic matter. So every time you mow um, that green manure, you're adding lots of kind of um, organic matter that then rots down into the soil and feeds the kind of soil life. Um, yeah, and then in nature, you sort of, you never see any bare soil. Um, and if you do see bare soil, plants very quickly start to grow and um, the sort of plant roots in, in the soil at all times in nature. So we try to um, also um, kind of mimic this in the way that we farm. Um, so for example, we only clear our crops like just before we're gonna plant the next one as much as we can. Um, if we need to leave a gap like with the leeks, we might leave the crop residue on the soil um, or we might add some compost and cover it over. So we're kind of um, feeding the organisms in the soil if we can't have living roots in the soil. Um, and yeah, cultivating the like living communities in the soil is really the key to supporting all of the life above ground and, um, and growing really healthy crops um, like this lovely rhubarb. Um, so yeah, and then another um, practice we use is under sowing. So I don't have a picture of this, but um, for example, last year we had a lovely kale crop, but um, as you probably know, if you grow kale, they're spaced quite widely on the bed. So there's lots of potential for bare soil um, in between the kale plants. So we sow a low growing clover underneath that kale. Um, so the soil's really nicely covered and there's lots of different roots in the ground, which is much more like um, you would see in nature. Um, conscious of time, I've got too much to say, but um, yeah, uh, finally, um, so we're trying out lots of different ways of um, minimizing the amount of cultivation that we do on the farm. So I'm sure lots of people have heard of no dig um, and we're trying this at kind of at the scale that we have, which is like seven acres. Um, so we do use a tractor to prepare our beds, but um, because we've got lots and lots of volunteers, um, 
this kind of a lot and like our system is set up for like mass people participation and just getting as many people involved in food growing as possible this allows us to try out um different ways of kind of um preparing ground or uh, changing over between crops that don't require us to use the tractor um and of course like um using a rotator or a harrow and um kind of turning over the soil in that in in a mechanical way um is yeah has a lot of detrimental effects on worms and um, fungal um, kind of fungal hyphae and all the other microbes in the soil. Um, so yeah, so the kind of we're trying to reduce reduce the amount of um, cultivation that we do to reduce that kind of damage on soil organisms, um, and we can do that thanks to our um, amazing community of volunteers. Um, and finally, yeah, so cultivating a community of people around the farm um, is another kind of way of practicing agroecology, um, trying to kind of contribute to a shift towards a fairer food system by trying to be an example of like a viable, small scale, local community focused um, farm. Um, and yeah, and training lots more farmers to go out there and grow more food in this way. Um, yeah, uh, how can you support us? So we have veg box scheme. Um, if you can afford to, um, the best way to, like one of the best ways to support us is to um, buy one of our veg boxes or at least spread the word um, so that we can kind of put, um, we're a social enterprise. So anything we make, we put back into trying to do more of the work we do um, with the community, um, training new farmers and trying to make our veg box scheme more accessible. Um, and then of course volunteering so you can check out our website so suttoncommunityfarm.org.uk um for all the information about veg boxes and volunteering and um yeah helping us to kind of trial these um agroecological practices and trial all these um exciting no dig practices on the farm um so yeah that was a real kind of zoom through and i feel like i'm missing things but yeah don't want to take up any more of your time <laughs> thank you Thanks so much, Rachel. It was so interesting. I could listen to all of you talk for probably the whole hour. <laughs> Sorry, Obi, over to you. Sure, try multitask. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't, I'm not sure about everyone else, but my head is like, woo! <laughs> so much and just incredible work. And if, yeah, if you can, you know, Sutton is um, in South London and there is really easy train access um, from London Bridge. And so, yeah, if you can get to there, please do go, go, go. And as Nicole mentioned, there's um, Lewis um, Coco Collective as well. Um, if you're interested in... Um, black and brown and global marginalized um and yeah and, and especially being in london we just have so many great examples of um of different practices and yeah hearing about how um agroecology especially uh, related to farming is um like an umbrella for many of the other terms like permaculture and etc has been really really interesting and there's a lot of food for thought sorry the puns and everything and um yeah and I'm really excited to um find out more and um, follow the all the links that you amazing links that you've shared and the action that we can take as well as as well as mentioning putting pressure on the government i'm going to hand over to poppy um if there are any burning questions please uh, you, uh we can we can stay on other people the speakers might need to leave um so um i what should we do should should we just see is there so anyone I think we could go over by two minutes or I don't know how how are our speakers feeling because really it's up to you guys because um, stay for a bit longer yeah, yeah. Stay a bit longer great <laughs> Nicole are you cool with that yeah definitely great and thanks so much yeah it's so hard to keep zoom events on the it's you know and also an hour is not a very long time really um has anyone got any particular questions I had quite, well, I've been reading up about Sri Lanka, I was going to mention, um, because that's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I guess you guys must be following what's going on there. Um, because the government actually um, banned fertilizers, artificial fertilizers, a year ago, last year. 
And because of that, there's been huge knock on effects for the farmers because there was no proper transition. So even um, the organic farmers are really upset about it. And it's actually going to cause like, um, there's some interesting articles out there that you can read about it. Um, because they had no time to transition properly or, and, and obviously their soils were really depleted from having used artificial fertilizers for many years. Um, it's actually like they're already experiencing massive food shortages in Sri Lanka and a huge economic crisis. Um, and this has been partly brought on by this ban of a sudden ban of fertilizers within their car farming culture. Um, so yeah, interesting stuff, read up on it. It's, it's gonna really affect them. And obviously also because of the fuel prices going up, um, a lot of farmers use mechanical tractors and so on to till their land. And so it's making their possibility. So I think it's, yeah. Sorry, just shows, doesn't on. it, Poppy, that you need a whole system approach and a transition. Absolutely. Yeah. That was far too hard and fast and it wasn't looking at the whole system. You know, no, you, can, and it's, you can get nutrients from other things, but you need to build it up and uh, yeah. have you training need, and advice. Mm. Exactly. Build up the knowledge and the culture of a different way of doing things and just changing things very quickly actually makes people very vulnerable, I think. Anyway, I'll stop talking there. Has anyone else got any other questions? Hi, I've got a question. I'm sorry I can't have my camera on, otherwise I won't be able to have be, be in the room, basically. Um, my name's Ali and... Um, I just wondered whether or not the speakers would be able to give us like one thing that we can do now. <laughs> so perhaps sign up for a, a, a veg box, but what other thing, um, piece of action would they recommend that we do in order to move this agenda forward? Um, Rebecca, can I start? Um, well, the most immediate thing would be to write to your MP about paraquat, um, about banning exports of paraquat, because that would be fantastic to um, really get a big push on that campaign and get many more people than just Land Workers Alliance people writing to MPs. Um, we've apparently already had a thousand letters sent, over a thousand letters sent, and we only launched a campaign this week. But um, it's it would be really great to send the message that these double standards just aren't acceptable and we can't ban things in this country and um, carry on ex making them and exporting them. So yes, banning paraquat and writing to your MP to ask them to do that, that would be great. Thank you, Rebecca. Anyone else, Nicole, have you got any ideas? Um, I was just, yeah, right to your MP, definitely, but also I was thinking, um, just get connected, I guess, with any growing initiative in your community area, I think is a good place to start as well. <laughs> Great. I have heard yeah, that, wanted, the, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I just wanted to ask, um, I did read because of the sanctions on Russia, that we are not importing fertilizers from them i don't know what i don't i've never i don't know what kind of fertilizers these are mm -hmm. and but now we're going back to manure even though this clean water act was passed a while back so they've reversed that so what are we feeding our animals because whatever we're feeding our animals are going to go in the water mm -hmm. so i don't know it's just uh chain reaction kind of thing it, I, I need to do some research on it i thought somebody might be able to um no yeah you know, somebody might know something more than what i knew um in a, sense, in a sense um there's a similar situation to what poppy described in sri lanka in that um i mean we're a lot of our farmers and our soils are fairly addicted to fertilizers at the moment and um, whether it's from them being banned or from shortages, which are actually mainly due to gas prices being really high. And gas is a really big input into the making of nitrogen fertilizers, which is why the prices of fertilizers have just gone through the roof this season. And um, basically farmers who've been using fertilizers can't just stop them overnight. It's a bit like 
um, getting a, someone who's addicted to drugs to just go cold turkey because it takes sort of three to five or ten years for soil organisms to really recover from um, from relying on fertilizers to generate soil fertility. Um, in terms of manures, I mean, there's also an issue because there aren't enough manures, and you're absolutely right that um, animal feeds are a really important part of that whole equation. And so that's not something we can all rely on. I mean, we need to just be helping farmers transition as fast as possible to a whole network of agroecological agro measures such as the ones Rachel spoke about. And green manures are really critical to that. So learn, teaching people how to use green manures um, and helping it be more economically viable to do that um, would be a really good solution. Um, but it is going to take time and you can't just change these things overnight. So what we really need urgently is agricultural policies that help farmers to make those transitions because farmers are really being pushed and squeezed from all the different sides at the moment and they need to have a supportive policy environment. So yes, I mean, there are just so many different aspects to it. It's a life's work as Vicky will probably tell you, but, um, but yes, getting the government to really support the transition to agroecology as quickly and effectively as possible is what we need to do. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm a I'm aware of the time, it's quarter okay. past eight, so I think we should probably, we could carry on talking for another hour, I'm sure. <laughs> and <laughs> it's so interesting, maybe we can have agroecology part two, you know. Um, Rob, I'll take one question from you, Rob, and then I'm going to wrap it up because it is quarter past eight, so we'll be quite quick with this, then we're going to wrap it up. Okay, a quick question to Vicky, I'm, I'm an addict of bug books. So what's special about you, your book compared to all the ones, Dave Golson, you know. Brilliant, pumps. Dave Golson is the, the professor. Um, mine's just a more accessible, I think, uh, well, no, he writes brilliantly, so it's just a big book. Mine's a little bit smaller and I've got, I've got tips all the way through and, and little okay. examples. Yeah, okay. but, but if you've read Dave's, you know, you're doing brilliant. He's a wonderful, wonderful man um, doing advocate. An advocate scientist is so precious. One of the most important things scientists who can get out there and be advocates for, for what okay. they okay. find. No, you're good that you love bugs. No, I love them. I, I put a pond in this year. It's only about <laughs> this too. diameter. Yeah. So about Me too. It's hard to inches. get. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's, yeah. But uh, that's that's a, that just another stage. Anyway, yeah. thank you very much. I look yeah. forward to the book. Thank you. So thank you so much to our speakers. I found all of you so interesting, so many different ways a lot of information to take in there and um, I hope everyone who attended has found it interesting if you have any pressing questions please get in touch with Obi and I and maybe we can try and find you some answers um, thank you again to Rachel to Nicole to Rebecca and Vicky and I hope you all have and hope to see you on that food march yeah. and <laughs> You know, check out the Land Workers Alliance. They're doing loads of great stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah. I hope that we can all get together another time very soon. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks for your bye -bye. time. Bye. 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 Thank you. Obi, should we stay on? Yeah. We can have a quick. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for Bye. coming. I wonder if Anita Hall is still there or if she's off doing something else. Um, oh yeah, gone. I just, Hooray, I just, it's just us in the room. Yeah, I, 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 just, I just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was brilliant. It was really good. There was a lot of, um, yeah, we could have just had you almost could have just like divided that in it's almost like we need more time but then I, I wrote that one 1.5 hours um and yeah yeah and speakers 
throughout or yeah, yeah maybe we should do one and a half hours because people don't have to stay for the whole thing i don't know no. it's a difficult one maybe one hour 15 yeah yeah um, yeah one hour 15 oh we're still recording i'm gonna stop recording <laughs>